Welcome to the Andy Staples Show. Return of Ari Wasserman. He survived his bachelor party, sort of. You're sh he's shaking his head. You didn't survive your bachelor party? I'm old, man. It's just not the same as it used to be. Um, I knew that. You know, I don't know. It is funny. You get to a point in time where you're just your body can't handle it anymore. And, you know, I remember back, I used to go to Vegas with the same group of guys when we were 25. You know, we'd hit a day, day club or a pool all day, drink all day, you know, maybe crash for two hours at five o'clock, rejuvenate, go to dinner, go to a club till 4 a.m., and then do that three straight days. And my dinner party did not make it to dinner the night we went to the Circa, Circa <laughs> Stadium swim. Like, people were just like, I'm not going. Like, it was just like, that was it. So, um, great weekend. Certainly survived, and it took me two full days to feel back to normal after I left. Um, but the good old days are over, Andy. And I, I hate to say it, but, you know, I've reached that point now where I can have a lot of fun and go hard for one day, and then maybe not even into the night, and then I'm cashed. That's – it. It time – gets us all eventually and and yeah. it happens and that's where it, it's the it's the recover the recovery the bounce back ability that that you lose and and when it's gone it never comes back so uh, it's what somebody asked me about my schedule in college the other day and i was explaining that you know i'd work at the newspaper until like three four in the morning get up at 7 30 go to class and and do it all every day and maybe sleep in friday morning because we didn't have a paper on saturday and I tried not to have classes on Friday, but you could just do it day after day after day. It didn't matter. And now, nope. But now you texted me on Sunday and said you heard a math riddle that blew your mind while drunk. Mm -hmm. so, and I was drunk when I texted you that. That's what I thought. What, is it, what does it feel like this? to know that I'm thinking about Andy Staples while I'm drunk at, at Stadium Swim? Kind of pathetic. <laughs> I do remember the riddle, and I'm very curious to hear what you have to say about it. All right. Um, and I, I might look like an idiot now that I'm I'm thinking. That's that's I'm, I'm what a, I'm excited about. That's, yeah. So, that's my favorite just, part. It, might, it just might turn out that I'm a moron. Um, okay, so I'm going to go with it now. Ready? Go for it. All right. Me, you, and Max Olson want to go camping. We go into the woods, and we mm -hmm. rent a tent from a very nice young man, and the tent cost $30. Okay. So me, you, and Max each contribute $10. You with me so far? One, we're, we're renting one tent. There's one three tent of us. We're splitting it three with ways. three Got beds, it. $30. Okay. The person who works there comes to the tent and says, actually, the rate for tonight is 25 not 30 So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you, Max, and Ari $1 each to account for the extra five, and I'm going to mm -hmm. take $2 as a tip. Does that make sense? That makes sense. So that means that me, you, and Max are each in it for $9 now instead of 10 right? Correct. Yep. What's nine times three? $27. And the $2 tip? Oh. Brings you to 29 Where did the dollar go? Oh, that is very confusing. Except we're not in it for $27. We're in it for $28. We're in it for, for $9.33 and a third cents each. That's, that's not why. That's not what happened. No, that's not the answer. That's precisely what happened. He took a two dollar tip, three dollars off. We're yeah. all in it for nine dollars. If we gave ten out of our pockets and then he gave us both back one dollar, we all have nine dollars. And that is true. So then we're at twenty seven dollars plus the the two dollar tip, and me and like a group of we're eight bad at friends, math on this podcast. There's we are very bad at math on this podcast. Screaming at their radios right now that that already know. Where so I'm I just and I want you to I want you to picture okay. this scene. We rented a, a cabana, and I'm also very bad at math, but this cabana for 10 people was sixty five hundred dollars for an entire afternoon. So that that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that was some some other bad math that we did, but it was uh divided by 10 wasn't terrible. Six hundred fifty per so we but part of it though was we got our own little pool area where we could walk out of the cabana and go into the pool and look up at the stadium swim Correct. screens. So there was like nine right. sporting events. It was a sports is, book. Right. It's a giant sports bar. It's a sports book a outside, but a yeah. pool instead of a seating area. Yeah. And me and five of my other friends are screaming at each other while inebriated about what the math problem means. And like, we could not figure it out for four hours. And then all it took was one person who was kind of good at math to explain it. 
and it still doesn't quite make sense to me, but the way that the math figures out, if you feel like you're stumped because I was stumped and I couldn't figure it out, I'm terrible. Well, there's another math. dollar floating around. Nobody knows somewhere. where the dollar went. And like, we can yeah. have, pe we can like go into the podcast and then you can kind of marinate on it a little bit longer. Yeah. And at the end of the show, I can tell you what the actual answer okay. is. Okay. Well, we, we, yeah, we, we have, we have a college football topic we need to get to. And it's actually one you brought up last week. You wanted to identify the most important person on each of the teams in the, in the country. And we can't do every single FBS team, but we figured we'd, we'd start with, with Stuart Mandel's way too early top 25, throw in some, some other teams of interest. And uh, it, it was interesting because you and I, I think we got a little mixed up on the concept because you, I think you thought that our listeners didn't understand how organizational charts worked because you were going to be like the head coach is the most important on every team. Well, that would make for a very boring show. But I don't know that's, that that's necessarily the case. Most of Not them would always. be the head coach, but I do think that you can make a case that someone else in the organization at the current time is more important. Well, so like the current time is the key thing this year. Like we were, you and I were, were texting back and forth about Georgia, for example. And with Kirby, we, we know what we're getting from Kirby. Like, obviously he's the most important person in that organization, but we know what we're getting from him. So who right now, based on their performance over the next 10 months will help determine what, but Georgia's I do think that under that circumstance that there are some head coaches who I would find expendable this year when we know what they're going to, we're going to get from them for a player or an assistant that makes them powerful. So I think the vast majority of the schools, the answer is going to be the head coach. Like, and, and some of them, the answer to me still is the head coach. Um, so like, if you want to start off like Alabama to me, I think the unequivocal answer, I don't care how cute you want to get it, but the Alabama answer oh, you is can't. Nick Saban. And the reason why is I don't care how good an assistant is or Bill O'Brien or the current quarterback or Bryce Young or whatever it is you want to say, in order for that operation to run to full capacity, the man in charge there is the main person who is pulling the strings. And no matter what year it is or what time it is or however, however you want to phrase the question, I'm not going to say that anybody outside of Nick Saban is the most important person at any point in time at Alabama. Yeah. But the, I mean, and that has proven itself time and time again when he loses assistance, when he loses strength coaches, when he loses, you name it. There is no other lost. answer to me. Right. It's always going to be Nick Saban. So that that's an easy one. But uh, we'll, we'll stay in the SEC West, and I'm not going in the order of Stewart's top 25. I'm just okay. going to bounce it around here because we got a lot of teams. And, and some of them, Andy, I'll be honest with you, I just did not know the answer. And we may not get to them all. I, okay. I think we need to we need to talk about the most interesting ones. One to me that jumps out is the one that had the number one recruiting class this year. But I'm not exactly sure. I'm not entirely sure how much of that recruiting class is going to make an immediate impact. It's actually somebody else coming new to Texas A&M that I think might be the most important, and that's Max Johnson. And I don't know if, I, if the answer to this is Max Johnson or if it's the Texas A&M starting quarterback, whoever that is, whether it's Max Johnson or Haynes King. But I don't know. Am I wrong, Ari? That the thing, the, the one ingredient that Texas A&M is missing it has been the special quarterback. Like you look at their two best years in the SEC, 2012, Johnny Manziel wins the Heisman. 2020, Kellen Mond is an above average quarterback in his fourth year as the starter. It seems like that's the piece. So right what's here. your answer though? I think it's Max Johnson. See, mine is even further back from that. Like if there was one person that you could absolutely not afford to lose at AM. And I guess if we're going to discount the head man that's recruiting like a madman. Right. Um, I said Connor Wegman because he's a five-star quarterback who is maybe. Well, and he could be the starting quarterback and, for all we know. And I don't know if he's going to be the starting quarterback as a true freshman, but the future of AM football and the recruiting class they just signed seems directly tied to the five-star quarterback from the Houston area that is going there. So, like, if you were to say what person in this organization could you absolutely not lose, to me it would be the future face of the program, whether that future begins uh, in four months or if that future begins in 16 months. I do believe that that guy is the most important piece to A&M football moving forward. Yeah. And that was my I, answer. I, well, and, and that's – I think that's consistent because 
it really it just depends on who becomes the star quarterback, whether it's Connor Wegman or whether it's Matt. If Max Johnson is a star, he's got three more years of eligibility because he played in 2020, so that doesn't count. So yeah. and maybe and, and that can change too. And he could Obviously. also leave after this year if he's really yeah. good. Like that's that's the other piece of and it. And one thing I wanted to say as we continue to go down this list, I'm going to tell you if I would take that person that we choose from whatever school we're talking about over the current head coach. Because yeah. there are a few answers here that I would take over the head coach. Well, let's okay, let's skip to to another one that the the coach, we weren't sure if he was going to be back. Let's go to Michigan. You've mm-hmm. got Jim Harbaugh is back, but New coordinators on both sides of the ball. Who's the most important person in Michigan? Or is it a player? My, you know, I picked. Who's you pick? J.J. McCarthy. I See, I thought about that. I thought about it. Somebody, but I mine was going to be somebody with a name that starts with MC. Some, somebody oh, with yeah? a, yeah. In As which in name Kate would McNamara that be? Or J.J. McCarthy. Yeah, yeah. Uh I think that the MC answer is clearly the one that's gifted but, enough to play in the NFL. But could it be the 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 co OCs? But would you take JJ McCarthy? Like, if you were the athletic, okay, not not the athletic director. Right. If you were the czar of Michigan football, mm-hmm. and somebody Michigan said, Marble. "Andy Staples, you want Michigan to be as successful as possible for the next five years, but you have to remove Jim Harbaugh or JJ McCarthy from the equation moving forward, starting now, who would you remove? I mean, JJ McCarthy hasn't shown that he's definitely that guy. And the coach has now. Uh, More so, but that's what, that's why I go with the OCs because, you know, and, and look, I realize Josh Gaddis left, and you, and you get the, well, he wasn't, they'd kind of gotten away with it from what he was doing anyway, and, and Weiss was more important, and I, I don't know that. We're going to find that out. It also can't gonna, be, I'm gonna, I, I think that I picked coordinators a few times yeah. um, on this list, Andy, but because they leave so frequently when they're very good, I think that that should hinder their value a little bit because they already move frequently. So if you're if the most important person on your staff is somebody who, if is successful, will be offered a head coaching job somewhere else within the next two, uh, year or two, then you have to build your program to be able to sustain those losses because they're going to come. Yeah, so but it, I, I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about 2022. So right now, I need to know what Michigan's offense is going to be, and the performance of of Weiss and Moore, the the co coordinators, they are good. That's going to matter. Like they're, they're going to be the ones. I mean, I think Jim Harbaugh will make the ultimate decision who the starting quarterback is, but they're going to be the ones who get the most input. They're going to be the ones putting those guys through everything at practice. They're going to be the ones building the offense around whoever it is they decide on. I I think they may be the most important. Yeah. They're just at a very critical time in their program. I mean, they finally climbed the mountaintop. They did what, you know, everybody at Michigan was starving for them to do. And it's like, now is this going to revert back to a, a nine and three type team that gets its butt kicked by Ohio state at the end of the year, or is it going to beat Ohio state again and become a major factor in the big 10 East moving forward? And like, when it comes to that, obviously everybody has their own stake in the claim of, of importance of that. But like, I personally believe that if Michigan is going to take the next step and the next step would be to do what it did again, but then not get, boat raced by a very good team that the ability of the starting quarterback has to be elevated from the point that it was last year. And the only hope that Michigan has to, you know, transcend those things is to hand the ball to the most talented player on its roster at the most critical position and let him cook. So like to me, JJ McCarthy is the clear answer here. But you wouldn't say that about Stetson Bennett and Brock Vandegrift. Well, you want to do Georgia? We, we can. Yeah, let's do Georgia. Because who are your answers? We, we removed Kirby because Kirby is Kirby, right? So My, my answers were either going to be the Cody C's, Glenn Schumann and, and Will Muschamp. I couldn't decide. It was either Cody C's or Brock Bowers. Because I feel like you Brock Bowers being the most special player on offense, you're going to build that offense around him. And remember, Eric Gilbert may be playing some too. And also Darnell Washington. They could have the best group of tight ends we've seen 
in a college football program in a long time. And then also upgrade at receiver. Also, Georgia's got to be the only guys. program in America where tight end would be in this conversation. Absolutely. 100%. And it's because Brock Bowers is that good. But the, the defensive coordinators to me, I think, you know, Lanning leaving would be a bigger deal if we didn't. We know what Will Muschamp is as an SEC defensive coordinator. Like when he was head coach at Florida, the defenses were never the problem. And he had yeah. elite talent on those defenses all the time. Now, South Carolina, the defense became a problem toward the end, but also the talent level wasn't wasn't the same as what he usually had, whether it was at Auburn or, or Florida or Georgia. So now he's got elite talent. And, and so you lose some really good players. And it looks like they're probably going to have a couple top 10 guys in the you know, top 10 draft picks coming out of that defense. And then multiple first, second, third round type guys. I don't think it's going to matter. I think they're probably going to be, they may not be as dominant, but they're still going to be really good on defense. I don't know if it's just because I think the way that I think, and then it's just going to be consistent that way. But my answer, if Kirby smart was not the answer is, is, is Brock Vandegrift. Like it's the same thing to me. It's just That's like they won a national. I title. know. I you know. Can't, you can't do that. Sorry. I, I can't. You just I can't, can't say that. Georgia, if it wants to have long-term su success and be anything comparable to Alabama in the next 10 years, uh, which is their number one goal as a program now that they got over the national championship hunt, is to make sure that they have a, a star quarterback that they're recruiting moving on? Or is this team going to reach always Alabama sign status? always a five-star quarterback. But the fact of the matter is, the former walk-on has proven himself to be better than those guys or better for this team than those guys, and he won national title. So... You can win another national title with him. He's already shown you you can. So I, I don't like I Brock Vandegrift. If he, if he winds up starting, great. If he winds up transferring, oh well. Like there will be more five star quarterbacks that Georgia signs. Yeah, I, but I feel like Georgia, to a certain extent, and I agree with everything you just said. But until they won the national championship this year, and it was a very heartwarming story, I enjoyed watching it was kind of snake bitten with their five-star quarterbacks a little bit. So to me, like them taking a five-star quarterback and then him performing like a Tua or him performing like another SEC star. Like when's the last time Georgia had is like Jake Fromm's freshman year, like the, or what year was it when he was awesome? Was that his sophomore year? Yeah. Two, well, he was, he was good both of those years, 17 and 18. What was the year and that he, how, how old was he when they lost fields over him? He, he was a saw at, at the end of his sophomore year. Right. So going and into his Fields junior year. A year younger. Yeah. Yeah. So it just, I don't know, like to me, like the, the quarterback, but like if, if Georgia would have lost, and I guess it doesn't matter because they didn't, but if they would have lost the number one thing um, we would be talking about is their lack of, of dynamic quarterback play. And I don't, I know that they won the game with Stetson Bennett playing, but they also for three and a half quarters couldn't score a touchdown. So like, it's like a part of, of being a Alabama like program is having elite level quarterback talent. And maybe I sound like an idiot because they won, they just won a national championship without that. But I just mean for the long stay. Or the long maybe Stetson Bennett's good. Like, I think we... he's passable. I think he's good. Did Georgia like... win the game because Stetson Bennett elevated the offense and they scored at will because, or did they win because their defense that... was like the greatest defense in the history of organized football? I don't know. That throw. No, that, I, know. He, that, I mean he made that that's play. That's a perfect throw. Yeah, like, and I'm how many guys can make throw that throw? I'm not like, saying you can't throw the ball. I'm saying if if Georgia wants to continue on the trajectory of becoming, yes, their defense still has to be elite. Because remember, well, like we said Alabama, the most important person is Nick Saban, but Alabama also may have the two best players in the country, which is Will Anderson true every year, and, and Bryce Young, but. I don't know if it's it's the two best. Like these guys may be the two best. We'll see where CJ Stroud fits into that. Mm -hmm. We'll we'll see where some of these other Brock Bowers. But but don't you think that if Georgia is going to to take and I don't know maybe you and I have a different opinion of what the next level of Georgia football is. Maybe they reached it. They won the national championship discussion. No, I, I think I think that there's another the gear. ceiling of Georgia football is what Alabama has been. Yeah, they the ceiling to... of Georgia football is not going to get there with Stetson Bennett at quarterback. But Stetson Bennett's only going to be there one more year. And then you figure it out. 
Right now, you've got a guy who can who can win you a national title. Yeah, but I guess you're looking I don't, at it a little bit. I'm not guessing at that. He just won them a national title. I think that you are looking at the 2022 season, and and I am thinking about the 2022 season and beyond. Um, but see, that's all, all I care about is right now because we live in an age of the transfer portal. Everything can change. Like, but in the transfer portals, what makes this even more fascinating to me, because if a person is, is bound to leave or, or is a threat to leave, then the um, onus of keeping them there makes this yeah, even think, more I relevant. Think you look at, you look at five-star quarterbacks as a more precious commodity than I do, because I believe that there will be more next year. And if this guy didn't work, if he transfers, who cares? I'll take one next year. Yeah, like, and that's, I'm sure that's the case. There's no question. These yeah. these programs are all in the – I mean, for all we know, Arch Manning's going to go to Georgia in six months, and it's going to be over anyway. I, this so is what like, I want – this is the one I wanted to ask you about. So Texas is not on Stewart's way too early top 25. Thank God we're not just anointing – you know, pushing Texas into the top 25. Well, who do you but, think my, my answer is? Is it Arch Manning? <laughs> it's not Arch Manning. I wanted I you to say Arch Manning. No, no, is I'm it, actually writing Quinn, about Arch Manning Quinn right now, though? but it is Quinn Ewers, yes. Um, what if Quinn Ewers doesn't win the job? I think that also, then shoot me into the sun. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what we're doing. Um, you know, unless he's not very good for some reason, which would be a shock to me because I've seen him throw the football and it hums in the air. Um, and also, too, that Mike when Glennon's you... Mike Glennon's ball hummed, too. He was not a better quarterback than Russell Wilson. Yeah. Proven time true. and time again. Yeah. I mean, I trust the million of pe million people who have uh, evaluated him and his talent to tell me that he was the number one player in last year's class to, to be right about that. But I think the Quinn Ewers thing too isn't necessarily just about his talent. But you know, I don't even, I don't like like look at it like which person do you have to have on the team next year or on the staff next year to make sure you win ten games instead of eight. Like that's not what's important to me. What's important to me is the status of your program in general. And when you're talking about a quarterback who initially turned his back on the state, went to Ohio State, made some NIL money, and then returned back home to save Texas, the symbolic nature of who Quinn Ewers is and what he means to that program. I think you could make the case that Quinn Ewers means more to Texas than any other person on this list well, outside of Nick Saban means to their program. Let's not – see, you say save Texas. Let's yes. dial back the hyperbole. Texas, That's not hyperbole. They're, they're, they're in the shit already. I, oh, I'm Texas out. is in need of saving. I agree. But let's start with bowl eligibility before we go too crazy. I know, but what does save mean? Save doesn't mean win a national championship in 2023. It means make them a tough out in the Big 12, maybe win the Big 12, beat Oklahoma, and return to respectability instead of dropping random games to Kansas State in the middle of the year. And it's like if the person who was born in Dallas. Kansas, they lost to Kansas. Yeah, Kansas and Kansas State or whatever. other. Under, I, I forgot about that Kansas game. Um, somehow I forgot about that just temporarily, but I remember now and that's hilarious. Um, the idea of, of what he means from a symbolic standpoint, like, cause this all can't just be, well, without this player, uh, they're not going to be as good as they were. If he were on the team, it's also got to mean something for the, the overall viewpoint of the program nationally. And I just like, I, there is nothing. And like, there's a lot of, of incoming freshmen or, or players who haven't started at the quarterback position on my list. I mean, at Penn state drew Aller's mind. Because the number one thing that's held Penn State back from beating Ohio State, for the most part, is lack of elite quarterback play. And it's like, oh, they've got a five-star quarterback who like showed everybody he was a badass uh, at the Elite 11 last year and is from Ohio. Tell me, I'd rather take Drew Aller moving forward than James Franklin if I were the czar of Penn State football. Like there, There's a lot of different scenarios here where the player is more important than the coach. I'll, I'll, I'll give you one. Because this player, well, this player can make the new coach's job much easier. He can also ease a lot of really hurt feelings and make people forget about their ex. And I think you know where I'm going with this. Mm -hmm. If Dylan Gabriel, if Dylan Gabriel is good at Oklahoma, everyone will forget Lincoln Riley very quickly, especially if Brent Venables has a better defense than any Lincoln Riley team had. Is, is your, is your answer is that what your answer is for Oklahoma? Dylan Gabriel is my answer for Oklahoma. Yes. I guess Todd Bates, but I'm with you. That's a good one. I, Todd Bates is a great answer. Given Oklahoma, like the one thing Oklahoma has not been able to do since Gerald McCoy is have elite defensive linemen. 
Mm-hmm. And they've had some good pass rushers. Like they've had Nick Benito. Eric Stryker was a good college player, not physically the right size shape for, for the NFL, but they've not had an elite inside player. Now they might have had them last year, but did not use them correctly. They had some, I, I think you're going to see those defensive tackles from, from Oklahoma wind up being fairly productive NFL players. They may have been play, played a little bit out of position the last couple of years. Clemson Todd Bates is a defense. great answer. That's a great answer. Yeah, but I, you know, I am a, I guess I am a sucker for offensive skill talent. Like it's always been the case. When I was a beat writer, I always wanted to write about the skill players on offense. I think people are most what the eye follows in people, the game. Yeah, you know, like to this day too. Like yeah. I just like I don't know if I'm weird about this, but I view the quarterback position in general as the face of the program a lot of the times, even more so than the coach. And if you have a good quarterback, you obviously have a better team. And it's like even Kansas State, I did Jake Rubley, who's uh, the number 201 overall player in the country who signed with Kansas State in 2021. It's like, I bet you if you asked some people on this podcast who the head coach at Kansas State was, they couldn't even tell you the answer. You know, like, and that's, and we have a very smart college football fan base. Like, it's, oh, yeah. Like, sometimes I have to look up names of coaches because like, I go blank. Yeah. You know, and, and, and Chris Kleiman, you know, won national titles and he's an in, awesome in coach. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. And he's been yeah. a really good recruiter. Um, but like, I'm just going up my list here since we're, we're trying to not just get boring. Well, okay. I, but but like, I want to I ask you this because you brought up in a lot of cases that the quarterback may be more important than coach. And, and I just said, I think Dylan Gabriel having a great year can make Brent Venables time much easier his is easing into that job much easier. Who's more important at USC? Oh, I thought you were going to ask Lincoln me Riley Clemson. or Caleb Williams. Uh, Lincoln Riley. Okay. Cause he sets the whole tone. He's the one. He's the reason why in. he's there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that, I think that obviously um, the player most of the time is the coach is the reason the player is there, but like, I think USC is about to get a five-star offensive tackle out of Seattle here in a few days from the 2022 class and uh, Josh Connerly Jr. And it's just like that kid doesn't go to play for Clay Helton. So I think the entire USCification, if I could say it that way, of okay. coming back and being the Trojans and, you know, the, la- the lost city of Troy or whatever you want to call it from the peak. I think that USC has had a lot of hope and had a lot of different people as, as the head coach in the past. But I think this is the first time um, – they have any real chance of getting 80% to the Pete Carroll years with this guy. So, and Caleb Williams as is a result of, of Lincoln Riley. But if you take Lincoln Riley out of the discussion, like we have in some of the other categories, then it's unequivocally Caleb Williams. And, you know, no, I, I think, I don't think you have to take Lincoln Riley. I think you're right about this. I think, I think Lincoln Riley is the tone setter. I put a thousand dollars of my own cash on him. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. I forgot. We, we don't forget because I'm talking in the next buddy. three years. <laughs> the clock is ticking. Um, so going, I'm just like looking at this list here, um, and I've got some pretty interesting answers. But I think this is a nice segue to Clemson. Okay. So we know what Dabo Dabo did, right? Right. And I think that what he did as a program builder is the most impressive. Maybe Kirby Smart, you could say, but I, you know, Clemson was not Georgia. Before. I think the raw materials were there at Georgia. Like yeah, the factory, yeah. All you had to do was get the factory running at, at the right capacity. And Clemson's also at a very critical time, having lost its longtime defensive coordinator and some other defensive coaches. And, uh, and DJ and, and its offensive coordinator. Yeah, and DJ didn't have a great year last year. So, like, my answer here, if you have to take Dabo Sweeney out, and I think Dabo Sweeney might not be the answer here because um, his hires and his ability to adapt to the way the game is being. Um, played both on the field and in the recruiting realm, you know, his hires are going to be very important, you know, like yeah. his ability to adapt and be like Nick Saban in the sense yeah, of can, can Brandon Streeter. Yeah. When, when, when Chad Morris left, you know, Jeff Scott and Tony Elliott were on staff. They replaced Chad Morris. The offense probably got better afterward. Now, Chad Morris was critical in getting Deshaun Watson there, but you could argue that Tony Elliott as a play caller was was better suited and that the marriage of what they did offensively with what Venables did defensively worked better with with Elliott calling the plays. Now he's not calling the plays anymore. How much does that change things? Uh, again, defensively, how much does that change? When But 
the, the hires are internal. So theoretically, it's going to look very similar to what you saw. And that kind of scares me, the internal thing. Right, because it feels like they haven't evolved much, where, whereas people who recruit against them have. Uh, they, they took Hunter Johnson out of the transfer portal, a guy who'd already been there. You know, I I think with them, it's it's really who winds up winning the quarterback job, whether it's Clay, uh, Kate Klubnick or, or DJ Uyunglele. Does DJ my my answer that? is Cade Klubnick. Um, yeah. And that is because here's the thing, and this is my favorite stat in the entire world, and I might actually tattoo this stat on my chest. Do it. Um, only two, only three teams in the history of the modern day recruiting rankings have won a national championship without having signed a top five class in any of the previous four years. And one of those teams was the Auburn, uh, uh, the Auburn Cam Newton team. Cam Newton team. Yep. And the other two were Clemson, one with Trevor Lawrence and the other with uh, Deshaun, Deshaun Watson. And the thing that has changed with Clemson since those times, it's not that, that, you know, they don't you know recruit well, or they don't um, still have the eye in the sky for elite level talent, though half their staff left last year. It's that in all of these games, for the most part, they've had a distinct quarterback advantage. And now we're having a podcast in a world of the transfer portal where you just said five minutes ago that five-star quarterbacks grow on trees and it doesn't matter if they leave. I didn't say they grow on trees. I said there's always more. Yeah, if but there's always more. If you're Georgia. Now, that's like, not Look at the, the quarterbacks like, that are at these programs that Clemson had to beat to win national championships five years ago. I know. Like, look at where, where these guys, like where Ohio State is at the quarterback position now. Look at where Alabama is and Georgia is. Yeah, they, uh, they had to. They had to beat Tua. They had to beat uh, Tua was Jaylen the best Hurts. quarterback that they had to beat during the entire both runs. Right, right. Then they beat Justin Fields, but then they lost to Joe Burrow. Right, that, that year. yeah. And and having to having to, you know, win that. But if you go look at the quarterbacks they faced when they won national championships, Tua is the most recognizable name. Um. And now whenever they get back to the stage in the playoff, it's not going to be Deshaun Watson versus marginal pro prospect X at whatever team they're playing. No. They're going to be playing against a five-star quarterback or a person who beat out a five-star quarterback. I think quarterback play in general across the world of college football uh, because of coaches and because of the elite 11 and the personal, you know, you know, throwing coaches and all the stuff that these people sink their money into – the quarterback play has been elevated across the board. And if Clemson doesn't have the distinct advantage at that position that they used to have uh, in 2016 and 18 and some of the years in between, then I think that this is going to be a huge, huge time for their program. And I said this a year ago before they missed the playoff last year. And I'll say it again, like if Clemson doesn't adapt and learn to take kids out of the portal and recruit a different way or, or become open to hiring people that have new ideas from other programs, they are in a danger dangerous position in, in the sense that they could fall out of the perennial playoff contender club. So Cade Klubnick to me is a five-star quarterback from Texas coming into a team where the quarterback play wasn't where it needed to be. Um, despite the fact that the person who started last year was a Heisman trophy favorite before the year. But that we might know, not we be know the what answer, that though. means. I mean, the, the, the other starter at the other major school in his state also was a Heisman Trophy favorite mm -hmm. before last year, but at a different school. But if you wanted to tell benched. me that their new defensive coordinator, new offensive coordinator was is the most important person on that staff right now or that, that program, yeah. I'll take that. But I would be more inclined to pick one of them if they came from somewhere else. Well, and, and so it's interesting. I was listening to you talk about that, and I was thinking about another program with a very good quarterback, a guy that NFL teams are going to love, uh, who will probably be very much in the Heisman race this year, that we kind of know what we're going to get. He's got great receivers to throw to. He's got a big offensive line in front of him, CJ Stroud. I don't think I'd pick CJ Stroud as mm -hmm. Ohio State's most important person right now. I'd pick Jim Knowles. It's the only answer. Yeah. We need to see if Ohio State can play defense at an elite level again. That's what's missing because right, offensively, they are fine. I have nothing to add to that. Yeah. yeah. Seriously, it's just about whether or not Ohio State can find its defense again. Yeah. And the person that they brought in from another program, if you notice, you know, coming right off of the, the Clemson discussion, they went and found the best defensive coordinator that was playing at a at a fringe playoff level at a middle tier program. And they brought him in and paid him over two million dollars in order to be the head coach of the defense. And his success or failure at Ohio State will determine whether or not Ohio State wins a national championship in the next three years. Right. And what what he did at Oklahoma State is he took he had some pretty good players who were old, experienced, smart 
and he ran a defense that confused the hell out of offenses. So uh, they, they didn't. They and it'll be it'll be interesting too because now Jim Knowles, who ha- and I know they they brought in a transfer from Oklahoma State, but now he's going to have to run a defense where the players on the team are very inexperienced and youthful, but also mm-hmm. ooze talent at a level he's probably never coached before. Right. So, so it's, it's a different type you, of yes. Yeah. How do you recalibrate that? But unequivocally, the answer. I'm with you on that one. Oh yeah, and and the thing is, if he that's the one where I feel like of all the assistant coaching hires in the country this year, if that one works, that elevates you to national championship level. I mean, I remember just like that. back in the 2014 national championship run, uh, we were doing some reporting on the million dollar coordinator. And mm-hmm. I know Brent Venables at that time was one of them. Um, and Ohio state and Clemson were playing um, each other. And it was just like, why is Ohio state so far beyond behind salary structures um and i was a big deal back in the time but it's like if you see an assistant how many assistants in college football right now are making over two million dollars a year i bet you you could probably count them on two hands right it's not like that it's not a huge number but it's it it's it's the best assist it's really the best coordinators in the sec in the big 10 that's that's what it is so like but that to me was a symbolic you know seven or eight years ago they weren't paying anybody even a million now they're paying somebody two million dollars and i think to me if you're making half of what a head coach makes at a middle tier program uh, on an annual basis, then like you are the head coach of the defense. And that to me makes you incredibly valuable and the pressure's on too. You know, that's a, that's a tough place to, to meet expectations and they've fallen far short of them. Um, I've got a few fun ones if you want. Yeah, go for it. Throw them out. I'm very curious. And like, we're not just going to do top programs. Yeah, there's just, a few we're just, here. We're bouncing around the whole country. It's yeah, not, but there's a few here that I thought no were complete. Were kind yes. of interesting, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you my weird answers, and I want you to tell me if you think I'm stupid. Okay. So mine for LSU was Frank Wilson. Okay. Can you can you get players at the level that Ed Orgeron from got Louisiana, players, but then coach them up better? Yeah, and and you have somebody who has a long history of being a staffer both at LSU and McNeese State, has spent a lot of time in that state in the high school ranks. And this person was specifically hired by Brian Kelly to keep LSU um, in the same dominant footing that it has been in its own state. And from what I understand about Brian Kelly, he's never been particularly obsessed with recruiting. And at LSU, to beat Alabama and Georgia, you have to be. So to hire somebody that is going to keep the fence around Louisiana, like that success of that program isn't going to be based on Brian Kelly's ability to recruit. I think it's going to be based on the ability of the person that he hired to own Louisiana um, to do his job in that regard. I, so I think that's fair. I like that one. Okay. So I'm not an idiot yet. No, not okay. yet. Okay, Give it time. So the next one, Kentucky, um, I said Vince Merrow. I think you might be on the same, same page I, with me I on that am. one. He's, he's been very critical to their recruiting. And listen, Kentucky from a talent standpoint has taken m- some major steps forward. It's not just they find diamonds in the rough and develop them. Now they're actually getting pretty good raw material and then developing it as well. So I, I am very curious because I, I think the SEC East is really interesting right now. Georgia is Georgia. They are what they are. It's theirs for the taking. But between Kentucky, Tennessee, and Florida, and maybe South Carolina as well, and we'll see about Missouri, it feels like that second tier is wide open. That somebody somebody can go mm-hmm. take it, and Kentucky's in the best position to do that. And just like his his charge into Ohio, he's the right hand man of the head coach. Uh, and when Michigan State was flirting with him, you saw Kentucky was just like, "Where's the Brinks truck, and where's Vince Merrill's address?" And that's what you know what programs do to indicate how important they feel well, somebody is. While we're in the SEC East, I'm going to go with Hendon Hooker for Tennessee. I am. I was thinking about this earlier yeah? today. Really? What? What would have happened last year had Hendon Hooker just been the presumed starter the entire offseason? Like through spring practice, through summer. Because remember, it was just up in the air in the spring. He was there. Harrison Bailey was there. Then Joe Milton gets there. Joe Milton runs away with the job in summer and preseason camp. And it isn't until they, they, they're actually playing games and, and seeing you know what happens when you get hit to see – how different Hendon Hooker was and how different he made that offense. So now you have a full off season of Hendon Hooker as the quarterback and the starter and everybody knows it. How different does that make Tennessee 
Yeah, you loved Hendon Hooker last year. Right, like, like, I right do love it. I, well, I mean, just think about where that program was and, and the spark. It, he was the spark. And I realize I'm the one who said we got to give Josh Heupel some more credit, and we do. But Hendon Hooker was the spark. If Joe Milton had been the starting quarterback at Tennessee for the, the, the whole year, we would have been talking about Tennessee in some of the same terms we were talking about them previous years. Now we're looking at them as a program on the rise. And I'm I think gonna troll you. I'm just going to troll you right now, but my Go answer was Nico. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. But he's not going to be here this season. So No, I know. But what if yeah. he is the, the, uh, the name that brings Tennessee out of the ashes? It it could happen. I mean, th- that's the not thing. even on the field. But he could be, and and I think we talked about this when when Nico committed. The potential for Pied Piper effect from Nico is very intriguing because you look at the. But if you're if you're a Tennessee fan, would you rather win ten games or nine games this year? Or would you rather sign a top three class because of Nico? Both. No, which one would you rather? Why can't have? you? Why can't you do both? Because I mean, you. I'm Honestly, giving you a one or the other program, you got to do both. No, I know, so, but what, what do you think a fan would rather have right now? I think they'd rather they take the wins right now. Ten wins, because they because they feel like that'll that'll get them. The, but it's not an either or. They can win a bunch of games and sign Nico and a and a really good class because you, you think about okay the the Florida had the the Percy Harvin, Tim Tebow, Brandon Spice class that really set them on the path. Uh, Alabama, it was that 2008 class that had, I mean, the, the, the stars were incredible. Dante Hightower, Julio Jones, Barrett Jones, uh, you name it. They had just a ton of players that, that wound up being incredible college players. That's the kind of class you need. That's the kind of player you need. Texas A&M may have just signed that class. We don't know yet. I think taking the 10 wins and going to the Outback Bowl is short-sighted for the, the long-term viability. But it's not an either-or. You're, you're, you're I'm just saying which one would you rather have? Creating because an either-or. No, I'm making an either-or because we're make, we're deciding, do you want the quarterback right now who might be good enough to win you nine games? But here's, or do you want the, the quarterback thing, that might be the difference of the program long-term? That's but if why they go five or. and seven this year, perhaps Nico changes his mind. Yeah, I don't think he's going to change his mind. I don't think so either, but you never know. So... <laughs> But wink. I, 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 yeah, I, I'm gonna yeah, sprain my eyelid winking. Um, but yeah, I that one that that's an interesting one to me. But the, the Hendon Hooker thing, I just I'm curious to see what they look like with him as the the guy for an entire off season because he was so critical to what they did last year. So I, I I'm fascinated by that. Ari, right, we're we're short on time here. I I kind of can need I do a know. speed round. Yeah, get, let's do speed round. Speed round real quick, because I want... Um, so, Baylor, I think, is Mac Rhodes, the athletic director, because no matter who the head coach at Baylor is, they always seem to be good. So, it's up spend to Mac Rhodes money. to make ba- sure ba- to Baylor's spend some money and not make cash. a bad hire. Yeah, yeah. Baylor's got cash. That's why, you know, I think there, there's probably been lots of runs at Scott Drew on the basketball side, and he's still at Baylor. There's probably a good reason for that. You know, they can't compete with the Carolina Panthers, but I think they've gotten to the point where they compete with a lot of teams in, in major college football. Um, Wisconsin, Joe, Joe, uh, Rudolph, Joe Rudolph, <laughs> associate head coach, offensive line coach and run cord run game coordinator. Is that all I need to say? Um, uh, no, I, I mean, no, Joe Rudolph's gone. He's at Virginia tech. So that's, I mean, that's the big change. That's the difference. So then they are, they are just in a world of hurt. Are they? I, I think we'll if you out. ask them, they'd say things are things are are going to be different, and that might be a good thing. But you guys made fun of me for saying things are going to be different six months ago. Did I? Well, for me, saying that they had to be different. Well, Bobby Ingram's the new offensive coordinator. And remember, uh, his his was a name that came up with those Caleb Williams rumors because he and Caleb oh, Williams' yeah, dad. That's why you're making fun of me. Go go back, but I some fresh ideas there may not hurt. Oh, they can I ask you the worst thing? Can I ask you one last one, and then I'll tell you the answer to the math? Yeah. What was your Notre Dame answer? I think it has to be Marcus Freeman. Yeah, because he's like the and and they're all in, right? Matt Fortuna was on the show yesterday, and we talked all about the the change, and you know, clearly they're they're all in on him. What Matt said, which which I thought was interesting, and and you know, it comes through 
when you look back at how that decision got made was that as people met Marcus Freeman before they ever thought Brian Kelly might leave, the idea that Marcus Freeman was the next coach at Notre Dame began bubbling to the surface a few months after he got there. And then when Brian Kelly left, they're like, now? Okay, well, we were gonna if, if we were going to do this five years from now, let's just do this now. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you look at the way the players respond to him. It's infectious. He's still got to get it done on the field. He's coached a game. He's, he's coached one game, and they lost it uh, to a very good Oklahoma State team. So now we, need, we see what he can do on the field. But I, I don't doubt him in terms of recruiting. I think roster-wise, they're going to be as good or better than they have been. And then he's got he's to show he can do it on the field. Okay, so I kind of was excited to have the idea that this math situation had people's gr gears grinding for the entire show. Yeah, yeah, no, where's the dollar? You're bothering so me. So that's not the way that math works. You can't take the dollar or you can't take the dollar back and times it by three in the positive because you have to view these as negative numbers because we're in it for, for $10. Yes. Right? So if we're in it for 10, we're minus 10, not plus 10. Okay. So minus 10. Add a dollar, you're at negative nine. Negative nine uh, times three, you know, would put negative you at 27, 27. But then you have negative two from the dollar, which brings you back down to 25. So it, it works out fine. Uh -huh. There's no dollar missing. Gotcha. Wow. But, I, but it took me four hours to figure it out. So, uh, and honestly, if I didn't say anything, like people would be like, what is going on here? And one of my friends just kept saying, well, that's how math works. And I said, no, that's not how math works. <laughs> math is infallible. There's no there's no variation in results. But I think not knowing math, uh, math is infallible. But we prove on this show all the time that it's not necessary to be good at it to be productive members of. Well, the, I don't know for productive members of society, but we, we do. We do at least keep our families fed and pay our taxes and, and that sort of thing. Well, I was despite thinking, despite like, being very taxes, bad at math at all times. I think weird math tricks like that are the way that people cook their books. So if you cook your books, then I could see why somebody would be confused by it. But it just kind of reminds you of just well, like good news, IRS. I'm not capable of it. <laughs> so I, I have haven't started my taxes yet, Andy. I probably I probably should do that. Yeah, I think I think we both should. Do you ever delay your taxes because you don't want to pay what you owe? No, I just delay it because it sucks doing them. I know. I, what, I know that I'm I generally owe a know lot of what's going year. to happen and what what I what I will owe or be getting back, and and I have a pretty good idea of that, and have had a pretty good idea of that since the end of of the last calendar year. I just don't want to do it, and I, at some point I will sit down and do it, and it will be done. And well, I pay somebody to do it, but I haven't paid them yet because I know that I'm going to owe a lot of money <laughs> because I sold some stocks last year to buy Brit's engagement ring, and I think the 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 person. Uh, and the nice top hat's going to be put in his Uncle Sam would like to wet his beak <laughs> yeah, right yeah. now. That's exactly. No, I uh, I ghost wrote a book last year, and and that's a that's a 1099 situation. So, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of in the same boat as you. So. Yeah. Oh, that you got to hire somebody, you know, if it's not just yeah. straight W-2. But it uh, taxes are the biggest expense that you'll ever have in your entire life, and it's the worst thing in the world. And I don't understand it. I, I honestly don't. I don't understand. Don't? I, well, I bought a used car, okay. as you all know, and it pissed me off because I paid now, taxes. You, can't, you can deduct the sales tax you paid on that. That's a nice chunk Doesn't of change. It, none of the deductions that I have in my life ever outweigh the standard deduction, I don't think. Oh, I, if you, because I'm going to give all of the life changes you had. Yeah, this maybe year, buying a house and all that stuff. Maybe I'll, maybe I should hire an accountant, but. I don't understand why you have to pay taxes on your income, right? Mm -hmm. So our, our income is taxed. Oh, boy. And then I have to go Did, to a dealership. Didn't know we were getting political on this one. Is it political? I don't know if it's political. It's not politics. I just don't like the way I'm oh, your, your Your income is taxed by the federal government. Your sales tax is, is the state. Yeah, but I also know, too, that regardless of the, who the president is, this is how it would work. So it's not political right. at all. Right, okay. I don't know why I'm paying money on on... Like I'm investing money that has been taxed from my income and then mm -hmm. I'm paying money in taxes on any gain I get from money that I already bought in with that was already taxed. So like it's the same thing with buying a used car. I Your, the, the, your question. Oh, because you're saying because the state already took sales tax from the person who bought the car originally, 
Why should they be able they to They are take collecting Scott tax Scott twice on the same good, and they're collecting money that has already been taxed to buy it. Like, it's been t- this, this one Jeep that I bought has been taxed twice. But they're, they're collecting money from you that has been taxed by the federal government. They haven't gotten their piece of it. Whatever. Yet. I just like, I'm tired of being taxed in every direction. And like, I bought, you know what a card break is? <laughs> you live is? in Texas. You shouldn't be that tired. There are people who are taxed. No, I know. More. Well, you live in Florida. Yeah. You, you, yeah. you, and I, I have I, this. I've lived in Florida for a long time. Do you know what? Do you know that? There are some and, reasons for it. And I know that I told you it had to be done by four, but I want to say this one last thing. <laughs> so do you know that sports cards, did you collect them when you were a kid or is your son into them yet? He is, he is into football cards, which don't even get me started on the, uh, the new, uh, sports card monopolies and, and how those work. The, okay. The well, I'm very much scarcity. Yeah. Bill Landis got me into it and it's basically a casino to me. Yeah. Like you buy these boxes and if you hit the card that you get, it's worth a lot of money. So basically they have what's called a break. And I don't know how familiar you are, but some of the listeners are. So forgive me for explaining it, but because football card boxes now can be worth in between 800 and five grand, depending on what is inside or the potential of what's inside the box, people run what's called a break. And it means you bid for a spot of one of the 32 NFL teams. And if you hit a, you you bid and then you win a spot, then they randomize what team you get. And then whatever random team you get, if they pull a card that is assigned to that team out of the box, that card belongs to you. So a few nights ago, I did this before my bachelor party and I paid 50 bucks for a spot, a random spot in like four different boxes that they were opening. They spun the random wheel and I got the Chicago Bears. Mm -hmm. This guy pulled out a Justin Fields redemption ticket that is worth anywhere between four and five thousand dollars. So like I like it's yours. so, So it's so it belongs to me and he sent it to me. So like now I have this redemption ticket. That's not the card. It's a ticket that you plug into the site and then they send you the card in the mail. But I wanted to, and I thought about somebody offered me five grand for it or 4,000 bucks for it. And then I, I decided not to do it because there's a chance that this card could be worth a lot more if Justin Fields is ever really good. But then I found out if you put it on eBay mm-hmm. and you sell it for 5,000 bucks, they send you a tax form. And it's like, <laughs> are we getting, are we getting taxed on personal possessions now? Like has that always been the case? I mean, so it, let's say this. this it depends this on. It depends right on what here. state you live in. This sconce. sconce. Let's just say it came with the house, and for whatever reason, somebody I mean, you pay internet, property taxes. Somebody the, the, wants to buy that sconce for nine grand for some the reason. The sconce. The sconce is part of the assessed valuation of your home, so yes, you are paying property tax on the sconce. Okay, sconce is a terrible example because it's it's attached to my house. What about this chair right here? You like that chair? Um, it's it's a fine chair. It's made out of leather. It's a chair. Okay, whatever. I don't even know how much we paid for it. But let's just say that that chair is worth $12,000 all of a sudden. Right. And I want to sell that chair for $12,000. I'm going to be taxed on anything I sell? Over a certain amount, yeah. I don't understand that. It well, wasn't even an investment. Live, like, like in certain states, there's a personal property tax as well where you, you will be taxed on, on the assessed valuation of your car. Annually. That breath was for effect. You, I, I, I realize I want, that. I, I I'm, get, I'm I glad you moved. I, I'm glad you moved to Texas because the complaints out of you would be a lot worse if you lived somewhere else. I'm just, I'm like done a lot of adult things in the past year, as you all know, and like I'm learning what things are taxed, and it's very frustrating. It's like I can't <laughs> even sell a baseball card without getting taxed. If it's a worthless baseball card, you wouldn't know. Nobody would care. I just so, thought that, like, if you sold something that belonged to you. Yeah, uh, it's it, it's it, it is it is frustrating as as you grow up and and my wife and I always laugh about the the difference in the way people approach that discussion when they're nineteen and when they're homeowners. It is a very different, and I'm not getting political. And I realize there are a lot of you who may feel differently about all this, but I guarantee you, the first time you bought a house. And then did your taxes, you felt differently than you did when you were filling out that 1040 easy when you were 19. Oh boy. <laughs> it's just, it's just how it well, goes. This is my oh. first round of taxes where I'm a father and a homeowner. So I'll let you know how it goes. Well, good news about being a father. Deduction. We'll break on that. So, yeah. <laughs> all right. Ari, it has been a pleasure. Stars matter on Thursday. Ari and Mitch Light. Ari's writing about Quinn. You are writing about Arch Manning right now. Uh, the the Arch Manning hype train is 
I, I enjoy it so much. I think you and I should have an episode are... in the next month about just Arch Manning and what it means. I, it fascinates me because this is a very good player. And I do wonder, though, if he was not Arch Manning, if he's not Peyton and Eli's nephew, Cooper's son, how differently do we view him? I, it is a fascinating subject. So you got that. Stars Matter on Thursday. Friday, me, Ari, David Ubbin. We're ranking the jobs of the new SEC. We did we did the job rankings last year, but the SEC has added two programs. And you know, I think you can, I realize it, it may be until 2025, but I think we can reasonably expect if you work at Texas and Oklahoma now, there's a good chance you will coach in the SEC. So we're going we're gonna to see where they slot in. And does that Texas-Oklahoma argument, the, the knockdown drag out that Ari and I had last year, does that change now that they're going to the SEC? We'll talk about it on Friday.